By the end of World War II, the Red Army was encountering a bit of a problem with its guns. The 85mm, although perfectly good, was coming across trouble with the later versions of the German vehicles. As a result, it was decided to go one bigger. Uh, the 100mm D10 was in service, and that seemed to rather fit the bill. The problem was that it didn't really fit all that well in the T-3485's turret or the T-44's. I mean, yeah, theoretically you could shove it in, but it wasn't really practicable. As a result, the design of a new tank was needed. By early 1945, a new vehicle was seen on the testing grounds. It looked a lot like a modified T-44. Uh, this was T-54, or at least what would so become. The following year, it entered service. It was the T-54-1 model 1946. A couple of tweaks later, they made the model 1949, and then the big jump, the model 1951. The 51 model was the one which introduced to the T-54 series the distinctive turret, which was retained through the 54, 55, and was the genesis for most of the later vehicles until you got to the T-90. The vehicle behind is a T-55A. It's another successor vehicle that was developed. Now, the difference between the T-54 and the T-55 was primarily that the T-54 was not capable of operating in a nuclear, biological, chemical environment. And with the advent of the A-bomb on both sides, it was considered to be something of an important criterion. The T-55 also introduced a slightly more powerful engine, more ammunition stowage, but most importantly, you did have now the MBC capability. The vehicle is in Czech markings. Uh, the Czechoslovakians were one of a group of nations to build T-54s, 55s. They built them between the mid-60s and the late 70s. They saw service through to the disbanding of the Czechoslovakian army in 1991, and the successor states, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, continued to operate it until about 2001, when they were finally retired. As ever, we'll start around with the outside and then finally move in. So as we look at the outside of the T-55, you see the iconic shape, almost uh, unforgettable. The glacis is well sloped, doesn't have any unnecessary protrusions. Uh, there is a single headlight and blackout light on the right-hand side behind the bush guard, tow hooks, the splashboard, it stops, oddly enough, water from riding up the bow into either the turret ring or, in my case at least, the driver's face. Uh, there, the hatches are sealed, in theory, with rubber. In reality, the chances are if your hatch gets submerged, you're going to get wet. This is a rubber bung. It is designed to stop rain getting in for the port for the hull machine gun. This is a fixed machine gun. It was steered, aimed by steering the tank. So the driver got something to play with. A complete and utter waste of space eventually was deleted. Uh, later T-55s, uh, they didn't have the hull at all. And the advantage was you got to carry more main gun ammo instead. As we continue on, uh, you could see the linkage for the infrared spotlight. It's an external linkage so that the infrared light is always coaxial uh, to the gun. Speaking of the gun, at the very end of the gun is a fume extractor. It's commonly thought if it has a fume extractor as a T-55, if it does not as a T-54, this is not true. It is not an indicator. You'll see 54s with or without. You'll see 55s with or without. As we move a little bit further along, you can see the external port for the gun sight. Spare track blocks are mounted above the fenders. Speaking of the fenders, a nice simple design. You simply lift up the retaining bar. It's a little torsion spring. Lift up. And you have access to the idler wheel. It would appear that uh, tension for the idler is conducted by use of these two bolts here, simply because I can't see any other way of doing it. Moving down to the running gear, nothing too surprising. 10 wheels per side, mounted in pairs. Torsion bar suspension, and if this is the perfect example of people in army identification tests going crispy suspension, it's not. It's, it's perfectly normal torsion bar, unsupported. Uh, it is to be noted that there are uh, rails mounted, I, I guess I'll call them rails or you can call them ramps, 
uh, designed to reduce the effect of uh, track slap. If the vehicle is going over too much rough ground, they don't want the tracks whacking off against the, uh, the sponsons. So uh, they have these little ramps built. The tracks are single pin. These are live tracks, it looks like, with uh, uh, rubber bushings and held in place by a bolt. However, if we look at the back, we can see the ramp that goes to the older style track. Now you remember I mentioned how crude the T34 was in places by the ridiculously uh, archaic system of track pins that if they got too far out, they just get whacked back into place by the ramp. Well, this is it. The T55s were built with this ramp as well for the older type track. And I've seen T62s with the same system. That said, there's nothing to complain about the track. Otherwise, it does a perfectly serviceable job. Single center guides, uh, good grip. Uh, you just don't want to be uh, on tarmac in especially in the wet because you don't get all that much traction from the metal. And that's one of those design questions. Do you want metal track pads? Do you want uh, rubber ones? We in the West went rubber. If nothing else, so that we don't rip up the Autobahns. As we get further up, we can see external fuel tanks. Uh, some people say this is a problem. I argue it isn't, and obviously the uh, Soviets agreed with me. Uh, a couple of reasons. Firstly, if you get a hole punched in it, so what? If you're going to start a fire, you have to have oxygen, and if the tank is full, you're not going to have any oxygen in there to begin with. Uh, however, let's say that it's not full, and there is oxygen, and there is sufficient ignition to start the fire. Well, where is the fire going to be? It's on the outside of the tank, away from the engine. Um, on, as possible, maybe let's say the hole is here, the fuel will flow out onto the ground behind the tank or onto the sponson in here. Not much of an issue. The whole side is now vertical. They, they got rid of the angled uh, interior from the ISs and T34. Uh, it just wasn't worth the, uh, the volumetric problems, the structural problems and uh, they got around the turret ring limitation by simply creating a larger turret platform which is inserted onto the uh, whole sides. As you come around to the back of the vehicle, we have racks here for external 200 liter drums. These would extend the range of the vehicle from the basic 500 kilometers to a quite respectable 700. Underneath is mounted the snorkel. Uh, for deep water fording, you would mount this in the place of the loader's periscope, just in front of the loader's hatch. There are two types. There is a wider one used for training and there is a narrower one uh, used operationally. Exactly why I'm not entirely sure. I mean, you, you would have thought that you would see this wake from either a small or a wide periscope traversing a river. You might become a bit suspicious. Anyway, uh, another possibility for mounting here would be the attachment point for the legendary log, uh, which is not on this vehicle, oddly. Other points, there is a little access port here for the transmission system. You see the tow hooks, marker lights on the side, and that's it. So uh, now I get to climb up onto the engine deck. So as I climb up the left side of the tank, there's stowage boxes on the hull, turret and of course the exhaust is on the left. This is very easy to walk up to. You just stand on the road wheel, stand on the track, use the handheld to pull you up. Easy. So the tour of the engine deck is actually going to be fairly quick because frankly I can't open anything up. Uh, there are access points for the transmission radiator at the front in order to open that up uh, you got to spin the turret in order to open these transmission ones up you we have to find a large wrench and open that uh, there are intake grills here which are uh, can be covered by spring-loaded flaps as near as i can tell they're really there for uh, cooling purposes in non-combat situations or very very hot climates uh, underneath me, the engine is the V55. It is a 12-cylinder water-cooled diesel. Cranks out 580 horsepower. This is one of the improvements over the earlier engine on the T54, which is only uh, 520 horsepower. 
The vehicle will travel along at approximately 52 kilometers an hour uh, on roads, off road about 30. Now, I've ridden one of these things and it is amazing how jerky uh, the vehicle is. Uh, it's not what I would call a smooth ride. Still, it does do the job. So as I'm up on the turret roof looking at the exterior, a couple of things. Firstly, there's a marker light actually right behind me. They're all, they're all over the vehicle. The cupola fairings, well, I call them cupolas, I guess they're not really. The hatch fairings are a little bit bigger than they were on the T-Fitch 4 part of the MBC system protections. Uh, and another part of the MBC system protection is the missing mushroom-shaped housing in front of the loader's hatch on the T-54s. Now I mentioned that the fume extractor was not a reliable way of telling a 54 from a 55. Well, that mushroom-shaped vent, which is missing from this vehicle, is your indicator. It was not compatible with the NBC system. It was basically, it was a hole in the turret. So 55s deleted it. And uh, if you see a mushroom-shaped housing on it, you know it's a 54 or a Type 59. You know, basically, it's a 54 series vehicle. The loader has the 12.7 millimeter to play with. Uh, we've seen it on other videos, so the fact that it's not here because the uh, government apparently didn't like having fake guns on tanks, uh, we had to chop it up. The loader's periscope is located just to the front, and that is, as I say, where you would mount the snorkel for deep water fording operations. The commander does have an infrared lamp of his own as well, that's in, used in conjunction with his own sight. And uh, that's pretty much it for the turret. The front of the turret is approximately 8 inches thick, so around 200 millimeters, and well sloped. So for its time, uh, it was a very well protected tank. So as I'm about to get into the vehicle for part two, you're going to have to come back, uh, it is worth noting one of the differences in Western and Soviet tank design philosophy. You'll see that the hatch opens up and forwards. So as the commander is standing on his seat and looking out, he has protection from bullets. And of course, his head is completely exposed. Now, if you compare this to a European tank, which either opens up and sideways or up and back, they provide no frontal protection at all. Uh, however, what the European ones allow, which the Soviet does not, is the open protected position. The British will call it the umbrella position. And that gives you protection from your head while still allowing you to see quite reasonably outside uh, from a protected position. The Soviets, generally speaking, if you were in battle, your hatches were closed. So it was more for um, marshalling purposes for, let's say for some reason you really had to stick your head out, you had this to protect you, maybe you're going over some very narrow terrain and you really wanted to make sure that your driver wasn't going to fall off the edge. Uh, otherwise, close the hatch. Westerners, we like to fight with the hatch open. Uh, even if your head isn't sticking out, you like to have the ability to stick your head out, so not having a roof over your head is pretty handy. Well, that concludes part one, and we'll see you back later for part two.